All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Creating Collections, Digital Museum Resources, and the Smithsonian Learning Lab. My name is Tess Porter, and I'm a digital content producer here at the Smithsonian's Office of Educational Technology, where I both work on the learning lab, developing new tools and features. I build collections on the platform and I help other people do the same and I'm excited to do so today. During this session, we're going to explore how to create and personalize collections of digital museum resources on the lab to support your teaching. In the first 30 minutes of this session, we're going to explore the following things together, um, really the basics of creating and personalizing a collection. We'll start with creating your first collection, then I'll show you how to add interactive text, questions, and other standalone tools, how to upload external resources as well. As you know, if you watched Philippa's session last week, you weren't restricted to only using Smithsonian resources when you create collections in the lab. You can also include resources uh, that you found elsewhere or are located on your own computer. So that's what we're going to be doing together during the first 30 minutes of the session. During the last 30 minutes, we're going to open it up to open Q&A. I'll be here to answer any questions that you have about the Learning Lab. So. If it's a question about what we covered in the first 30 minutes or something else, like you would like a general introduction to what the lab is, you want some help finding a particular type of resource or collection, or maybe you need a step-by-step -step tutorial on something else, I'm here for you. So in the first 30 minutes, we're going to cover the basics of how to create and personalize collections of resources. And in the final 30, we will uh, have some time for open Q&A. Uh, to give you help on whatever you need help with. This is part of a series of sessions we run every week or uh, throughout the month uh, uh, here on the Learning Lab covering a variety of things uh, using digital museum resources for learning. This session is a follow-up to the Getting Started session, which I believe my ho uh, colleague hosted last week uh, that focused on the basics of the Learning Lab. This is a continuation of that. Here's our upcoming session schedule. Later this month, I'm really excited to share that we're going to be hosting a cultivating learning session that's going to be focusing on digital storytelling to foster student engagement. We've got a few guests for that session. Jamie Gillen and Matthew Decker will be joining us from Montgomery College alongside one of their students. And then on this list, you can see uh, the next sessions for getting started and creating collections as well. If you'd like to keep up to date with our schedule of events, you can do so at our Help Center. The URL is here on the screen, learninglab.si.edu slash help. So throughout the session, I want to hear from you. Uh, I want to make sure that what I'm sharing today is as helpful for you as it can be. So I would love to hear your questions, whether it's during that first 30 minutes where I have some stuff prepared to share or during the open Q&A. Uh, if you have a question, please send it. And there are a couple ways you can do so depending on where you're joining us today. If you're joining us on YouTube, you can share questions at any time using the chat box, which you'll see to the right of the video on YouTube. And if you're joining us on Facebook, you can share questions at any time using the comment box, which you'll see below the video on Facebook. So with all of that said, let's jump over to the Learning Lab. If you want to follow along with me during this session, you can do so. Uh, I'm going to go over to learninglab.si.edu, which I've got open in another tab here. So during the session that my colleague Philippa hosted last week, she covered the basics of what the Learning Lab is. She shared that it's a free website designed for teachers and students, but available for anyone to use where you can discover digital museum resources, create interactive experiences with them, and share your discoveries and creations with others. And she shared some examples of what Learning Lab collections can look like. Um, to get started in demonstrating how to create and personalize collections of your own today, the first thing I wanted to show you is how to search for resources um, to find those building blocks for creating your first collection. 
If I want to search for either resources or collections, I'll go to the search bar, which you'll see on the upper left of every page on the Learning Lab. Typing in my search terms here will show me some examples of both resources and collections that might be helpful to uh, my search term. So for the demo collection today, I'm going to create a collection about community. I'm going to look for maybe some photographs or artworks of community that I might use to start a conversation with my students. So typing in community here, first I see some suggestions for ways that I can narrow or expand uh, my search. So if I'm thinking about community, the Learning Lab suggests I, I might think about also searching for community activists, community centers, community development, and more. For collections, I can see some previews of collections that other users on the Learning Lab have created and published. Um, even if I'm looking for resources and creating something new, I highly recommend taking a peek at collections as well. It can be a great place to get some ideas on other resources that might uh, relate to the topic that I'm interested in. And I might even get some good inspiration on how to use resources with students to explore a particular topic. For now, though, I'm going to see just what a search for community brings me um, in terms of resources. So I've hit enter. Give it a second to load here. So it'll first show me resources related to my search term, but if I wanted to view collections, I can do so in that tab here. So perhaps unsurprisingly, a search for community brings over 44,000 resources, which is cool, but that's way too much to go through. So I'm gonna use some of the lab's uh, search filters to help narrow my search. Those are located on the left-hand side of the screen here. If it's not open automatically, this panel, I'll click the Refine Search button. On the right, I'll see a tile of images. Each one of these is a resource that I can click on to view in greater detail. So let's narrow this search down. I can start by narrowing my search by media type. So I could say, you know, I just want to see images or videos or 3D resources or something else. For this, since I'm interested in images, maybe uh, photographs and artwork, I'm going to click image here. I can filter by resource characteristics, which include whether or not it includes transcription or is in the public domain. I can uh, refine my search by resource provider, which means the museum that the resource comes from. If I'm thinking about finding some interesting starting points for a discussion around community, thinking about artwork and photographs, maybe I'll find what I'm looking for from the Smithsonian American Art Museum. I could select multiple if I like. And then I can also narrow my search by date range, culture, and place. So right now I'm just going to see what images I can find from the Smithsonian American Art Museum related to community. I've clicked my filters, and now I'm going to click the blue Update Search button. And here I've been able to narrow my search from order over 44,000 to just over 100, which is still a lot, but it's a lot more manageable. Um, from this point, I can continue to filter my search, or I might start by just clicking around. As uh, you may have seen in the section last week, uh, if I'd like to view any of these resources in detail, I can do so just by clicking on them. Here I can zoom in to see the image more closely using zoom buttons in the lower left. And on the left hand side of the screen, I've got a series of buttons that can help me interact with it in different ways. The first is the information button, which will show me information about this resource from the museum that houses it. This seems like a pretty good resource to start with. It is from an exhibition about community in place and urban photography. It's a really interesting image of a child uh, playing with a kite on top of a rooftop. I think I want to use this in my starting collection. So if I want to create a collection from this resource, what I will do is I'm going to look again at these buttons here on the left hand side of the page. And uh, specifically, I'm going to look for the one that has three rectangles on top of each other with a plus sign on top. When I hover over it, it says add to collection. 
clicking this will allow me to do two different things while logged into my Learning Lab account. Just to note, I've already logged into my free Learning Lab account. So if I click this, if I'm a new user creating a collection for the first time, it'll automatically prompt me to create a new collection. If not, it might prompt me to add a resource to one of my existing collections. Since I want to create something new, I'm going to click on the Create a Collection tab here, though. Here, it will ask me to give my collection a name and a description that I can change later. So for now, I'm just going to call this Explorations of Community, and I'm going to say my description is to be decided. I'm going to come back to this later. Now that I filled this out, I'm ready to create my first collection. I'm going to click this blue Create Collection button. And a green pop-up says, it's successfully added. I've created my first collection. Why don't we go ahead and add some more resources to this collection that I'm working on? I'm going to go back out to my search, just to the previous page. And I'm going to cont continue looking for resources that seem interesting to me. As I hover over these images, I can see that Add to Collection button here too, and I can actually add resources to my collection from the screen as well. So if I click this Add to Collection button, it'll give me this overlay again. I have a collection I've already created called Explorations of Community. So if I'd like to add it to that collection I just created, I'll click on the collection thumbnail so it has a blue check mark, and then click the blue Add button again. Let's add one more. Actually, let's do this one. OK, cool. I can, of course, continue adding resources later using the same method I just showed you. All right, so let's have a look at my new collection that I'm working on and start to make some changes. So to see the new collection I just created, I'm going to go over to the Sunburst in the upper right. This is the main navigation tool of the Learning Lab, and it'll help me navigate around to places like the home page, my profile page, or collections that I've created. So I'm going to click the Collections button here. You may have learned this if you tuned into a uh, fill up a session last week, but when you create a collection for the first time, it is what we call unpublished. It means it's just viewable to you and those you share the URL with. When you publish a collection, you make it discoverable on the Learning Lab search engine for anyone to find. It also becomes available in places like Google too for other people to adapt and use for learning. Um, because my new collection is unpublished, um, it's going to show up on a tab here called My Unpublished Collections. Right now, the first page you see here is My Published Collections, and I've been pretty busy in the Learning Lab, so you're seeing a lot here. To find the new collection that you just created, be sure to click the My Unpublished Collections tab, and your new collection will appear here right at the top. Click on the thumbnail to view the collection in detail. All right, and here is my new collection. So that is how you create and add uh, additional resources to a collection for the first time. Just checking on the chat here. Awesome. Glad to have you joining us. Nice to see you, Ada. So the next thing that we're going to do together is edit a collection. Specifically, we're going to be looking at ways to add interactivity to the resources that you've added here, uh, whether it be text, questions, or something else. Uh, to edit your collection, look at the top right for a series of buttons here and click the green Edit Collection button. This will put you into edit mode where you can make a variety of changes to your collection. You'll know you're in edit mode because of the green bar at the top of the screen. When you create a collection for the first time, autosave will automatically be turned on and the collection will save itself once every minute so you don't have to worry about lost changes. When you're ready to exit out of edit mode, this is where you could do this as well by clicking the exit button. I'll show you that in a bit. 
So first, let's have a look at these resources. I've decided to pull them in in this order, but maybe I want to change this up. If I want to move the order of resources, all I have to do is click and drag. And if I want to add interactivity to any of these, all I need to do is click on the resource. So let's do uh, this photo studio. So automatically what opens up here is the customization panel, which I can see with the paperclip. Uh, this will allow me to add a variety of things to this resource, specifically text, questions, and what we call hotspots, which let you highlight and annotate areas of interest on an image. With this panel already open, and if it's ever closed, just click on the paperclip to open it. I'll go over to the add button on the left hand side of the screen to add some interactivity to it. Let's add some text. So I'm going to click the info text button. This will set me up with a title and description field where I can add whatever I like. For this, I might start off with thinking about adding some instructions for students. I could also use this to add more information. Uh, so maybe I'll call this introduction. And I'm going to have some text. All right, maybe I want to follow this up with some questions. To do so, I'll go right back up to that Add button and click the Quiz Questions tab here. I can add a variety of different types of questions to this resource. Uh, going down to the drop down menu here, I can see I can add true, false, multiple choice, short answer, long answer, and I can ask students to submit a file, which works if I incorporate this with the lab's assignment feature. So maybe I'll start off with some short answer questions. So I'll select that option and click add question, and it'll set me up with a question field alongside an optional score and answer field. So I could ask some simple questions like, what do you see? Add another one. What do you think? Maybe rounding this uh, Project Zero See, Think, Wonder routine with what do you wonder? I can continue adding uh, interactivity here. I can add as many as I like. And just like rearranging resources in my collection, all I have to do is click and drag the icons if I want to change the order. Let me show you what Hotspots looks like real quick. It's one of my favorite tools. Again, you can use this to highlight and annotate areas of interest on an image. So I'm going to go back up to the Add button, click Image Hotspot to add this type. <clears throat> so what this will allow me to do is highlight areas of interest on an image. So maybe I really want to focus on some of the faces here. I click on the image to create a box that I can click and drag to rearrange. I can change the size by pulling on the corners and sides of the image. Maybe I'll make this a little bit smaller. Whoopsie, that's my window. Excuse me. <laughs> I, I can really do whatever I like here. Um, and then I have a little pop-up window that allows me to give this a title and description. I've seen some teachers use this to give information about what students are seeing in this image, pose questions as well. So I'll do just a little question. And I'll show you what this looks like in a moment. I can add multiple hotspots. So maybe I wanted to highlight something in the background next. I could do that. And then on the left, I have a space to give um, a some information here as well, both through a title and then a description field. I can also change the look of these hotspots. Uh, by default, they're boxes, but you can also make them buttons or highlights. And you can change the color scheme of these as well. So you can really make it look however you like. So let's have a peek at what this interactivity looks like on the public view of my collection. What people will see if I send them the URL of my collection or I publish my collection and make it available for anyone to find and use. So to exit out of edit mode, I'm gonna click the done button and the green bar to exit back out to the main collection view. And then I'll click the exit button. It'll ask me 
uh, well, first tell me if my save was successful and then ask me if I sh uh, definitely want to uh, leave uh, edit mode. I do. So I'm going to say, yes, I'm done. And here's my collection. You can see there's a new paperclip icon on the top left of this first resource. Then if I click on that resource, those uh, interactivity pieces are automatically going to open for me. But if not, I would just click on the paperclip icon there. Here I can see my uh, introductory text, my questions, and my hotspots. So those are the basics of how you add interactivity. Of course, this is kind of just uh, touching the tip of the iceberg. There are also things like sorting activities, standalone features, um, and more that you can add to collections. And if you're interested in learning more about those types of interactivity, let me know during the Q&A in the second half of our session. I'd be happy to walk it through it with it through it with you, excuse me. Um, the next thing I want to show is how to add external resources to your collection. Uh, whether you have something on another website that you want to pull in, maybe a YouTube video, uh, or something on your computer that you want to add. Maybe it's a PDF or a Word document cre you created, or say an image that your student took that you'd like to include. To add an external resource to your collection, first I've entered back into edit mode by clicking the green edit collection button. And then I'm gonna click the add a resource button here. It'll give me a few different options for adding a resource to my collection. And I'll just briefly touch upon what you're seeing here. I have the ability to add from my favorites, which uh, Philippa may have covered last week. It's essentially bookmarking. Uh, something on the learning lab to come back to later. So these are all things I found while searching that I thought, hey, this is cool, but I'm not sure how I want to use it yet. So I'm going to favorite it to make sure I don't lose it. You can add a standalone feature using this tab. You can even start a search within edit mode to find additional resources. This is great if you want to add resources in bulk. If I want to add an external resource, I'll click the upload our resource button. Here, it'll ask me to give the title of my resource and an optional description. And then it will ask me to uh, say whether or not I want to upload a URL, a link to another website, or I want to upload a file from my computer. Each one of these options has different fields to fill out. For uploading a file in particular, it asks me to add some citation information, which can be really helpful if I found an image somewhere else that I have the ability to upload here under fair use. Um, so saying who created it, whether it's myself or someplace like the Library of Congress, the URL where I found it, and more. Well, let's for now upload a URL and I'm going to upload a link to the Library of Congress homepage. This is an example because I think this is the URL. Okay. So I've given my resource a title. I could give a description here if I wanted, but I'm going to leave a blank for now because it's optional. I've said I want to contribute a URL and I've entered that URL here. Once all my fields are filled out, I'm going to click the blue add button to upload this resource to my collection. The learning lab will take a moment in the case of a URL resource to take a screenshot of the home page. And I can see this best actually if I exit out of edit mode to view it. So I'm going to exit out of edit mode. It's finishing taking the screenshot right now. There it is. All right, so let's go out of edit mode and then check out my new resource I pulled in. All right, so if I click on this new resource I uploaded, what it's going to give me is a description that it pulled in from the website itself, and then a screenshot of the website that links out to it. So if I click on this, it'll give me, it'll let me know I'm leaving the learning lab, and I or my learners can then interact directly with the website that I linked. If I uploaded a YouTube URL, the video would actually embed here directly so students wouldn't have to leave to view what I included. 
The last thing I want to show you before opening it up to Q&A is uh, how to edit information associated with your collection, whether it's your title, your description, or other bits of information about it, like the subject area, age levels that's appropriate for, and more. So to edit any of the information associated with your collection, after entering back into edit mode by clicking the edit collection button, look for the edit info button here. Here, it'll give you a bunch of different ways to add more information to your collection, which is especially helpful if you plan to publish your collection for other educators and learners to use. This will give you a space to add information about what this collection is, what you designed it for, how it should be used, subject areas it's designed for, age levels it's appropriate for, and more. It'll also let you do simple things like change your title if you aren't in love with the title that you gave it when you were starting out. So here on the first page, you can edit the title and description and add some other information like notes to other users or open information panels automatically. On the next tab, you can change the thumbnail of your collection. This is automatically set to be the first resource that you add to your collection, but you have the ability to change this to either any resource in your collection, any image that you upload from your computer, or you can even use the Labs New Canvas feature, which I just love. And if you want to learn more, ask me about it during the 30-minute Q&A. I'd be happy to walk you through it. But essentially, it, it allows you to mash together different resources on the Learning Lab with text, shapes, and lines to create something that's really your own. A lot of people use this tool to create unique thumbnails. You can also create multiple canvases within your collection to, for example, divide your collection into sections, encourage students to look closely alongside a question. You can even compare and contrast two images together. You could do a lot with it. It's essentially like a PowerPoint slide with all of those editing features to make something really unique. You can uh, tag the subject areas it's appropriate for. So I could say that, you know, we're talking about social studies and cultures, uh, age levels. This is for maybe middle school and elementary when I finish building it out and more. So that is creating collections in a nutshell. Then the last thing I want to show you is how to publish a collection if you decide that's something you'd like to do. Again, all collections, when you create them for the first time, are unpublished, viewable to just you and those you send the URL to. If you choose to publish it, you make the collection available uh, on the Learning Lab for anyone to find and use. However, when you publish, it doesn't mean that you can never make changes. You can still make any changes you like. You'll be able to continue editing the collection. See if you find more resources you want to pull in. Maybe you found a typo. Uh, you can also unpublish the collection if you'd like to do so as well. So if you feel like you're ready to publish, the button is right here for you. It's the blue one right next to Edit Collection. When you click this button, it'll give you another chance uh, to change the information associated with your collection before it goes uh, live to everyone. So we hope that was a helpful introduction on how to uh, create collections and add interactivity in the Learning Lab. In the final 30 minutes of this session, we're going to open up to uh, a large Q&A. I'll be here for the next 30 minutes to answer any questions you have, whether it's about something I just shared or about something else to the lab with the lab that I didn't have a chance to touch on. Um, I would, I, I'm open to everything. So some of the things I'm especially good at helping with are giving a general introduction to the learning lab. If you haven't uh, used the platform before, giving step-by-step -step tutorials on how to use all of our uh, features and uh, things that you can use to create something really unique. I can also help you search for and find resources or collections around a topic you're interested in if you're having trouble finding it. Um, so again, 
If you uh, missed the intro in the beginning, you can ask questions using one of two things, depending on the platform you're joining us on today. Um, if you're joining us on YouTube, you can send in questions using the chat, which you'll see to the right of the video, uh, just like in this picture here. If you're joining us on Facebook, the process is very similar. You can submit questions using the uh, comment section below the video. Something else I want to point out too is you're thinking about questions that you have uh, for the last 30 minutes of the session. This session will be archived when it uh, finishes airing live. So if you joined a little late, I want to see what you missed in the beginning, or maybe you need to leave, but you want to come back and check on questions that people ask later, you can do that. The archived version of this session will be available at the same link that you're watching it at now. So whether that's on YouTube or Facebook, you can come back here later when the session ends at 5 p.m. Eastern to watch the whole thing. We'll also continue linking it on our Help Center, which I linked earlier in the session, but this is where we host all of our upcoming and archive sessions. While I wait for questions to come in too, I just wanted to reiterate that this session is part of an ongoing series of sessions that we host every month here at the Learning Lab, exploring how to use digital museum resources for teaching. So uh, we have a cultivating learning session next, or two Mondays from now, with two fantastic professors from Montgomery College, Jamie Gillen and Matthew Decker. They're going to be talking about digital storytelling to foster student engagement for a variety of age levels. So this isn't just for uh, college level educators, this is really for everyone. Um, they'll be focusing on ready to use techniques and they'll even have a student um, being part of the session talking about ways to use these techniques right away. Um, we will also have another getting started and another creating collection section sessions in March. Excuse me, I've got a stuffy nose that's making it hard to talk clearly uh, uh, coming up in March as well. I see we have one question here from Allison. Thank you, Allison. Uh, let me pull it up here on the screen so I can read it and you can see it too. I have a question about file size preferences for uploading our own resources. We have large TIFF files for some of our photos. Allison, thank you so much for asking that question. Let me show you um, uh, the file types that we accept, the file size, and some tips I have uh, for getting your content onto the platform. So in the uploading overlay that I showed very briefly earlier, we have a list that you can refer to that includes the different accepted file types and file sizes. So I'm, to get there, I'm gonna go back into edit collection. And I'm gonna go back at, over to that uploading screen by clicking add a resource and then upload a resource here. And then I'm gonna click on, I want to upload a file. This is probably gonna be really hard to see on the screen even if I zoom in, but I just wanted to show you where this is so you can refer to it. For me, it says the maximum file size is 50 megabytes, but that's just because I'm an admin user and we're testing some things. For you, it'll be five megabytes. Uh, we don't accept TIFF files on the lab, but we do accept uh, GIFs, JPEGs, and PNGs. Um, if you're trying to figure out what file type you want to use, I would pick either a JPEG or a PNG unless you've got an animated GIF, which you can use on the Learning Lab and it'll animate within your collection. PNGs, uh, if I remember correctly, tend to end up having a larger file size but are better at resizing. Uh, JPEGs, are a little bit not as good at uh, resizing, but they are still pretty so strong and they have a smaller file uh, size. For pixels, if you really want to optimize it, I tend to shoot for no larger than 1600 by 1600 pixels. And I can put that here in the chat for you as well. I I. I think I use that number because it is the maximum size that the learning level display images at. So a quick way for me to check that are some custom graphics that I uploaded into collections. Um, let's 
I've been doing a lot of uh, different types of thumbnails. Uh, let me double check that um, in a moment so I don't keep you waiting. It's either 1600 or here, one more spot for me to check. What you're seeing me navigate to is the group profile page for the Smithsonian Office of Educational Technology, the office to which I belong. And we've got a lot of collections here that I've helped with, though don't have available on my profile page. So I'm looking for the graphic size that we used for like this one, for example. Just make sure I'm giving you the right, the right suggestion. Yep. 1600 by 1600, I was correct. Uh, let me put that here in the chat so you have it. Of course, I'm giving a square image size in the chat, but we accept landscape and portrait orientation images as well. Don't let that restrict you. I just wanted to give it as a ballpark uh, for uh, creating images. And I, I'm excited to see that you're excited about gifts too. I've seen people do really cool stuff with them lately. Um, in particular, I believe it's let me just show it to you while I wait for the next question to come in and for other folks too. I thought it was really cool. There's a series of collections being created by one of the museums here. And I saw one on Lori Anderson today that it was, I mean, obviously this is like if you have extensive gift knowledge, um, but this is from the Hershorn. They have this wonderful Hershorn Kids at Home series and they use gifts to make this collection just come a little bit alive. Um, but I've seen people use it to animate, say, a fish moving as well. You can do a more for just like a little wiggle, but that's all up to you. Um, if you're interested in seeing this collection more closely, you can search for Lori Anderson on the lab. That'll bring you to this collection. And from there, you'll be able to find the fantastic Hershorn Kids at Home series too. So I hope that was helpful. Thank you again, Allison, for that question. And Joan, I'm glad to hear that was helpful for you too. Um, again, for those of you watching, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'm just here for the next 20 or so minutes to answer any questions you have about the Learning Lab. So maybe I, I can help you with things like if you're interested in a technical feature uh, and want to learn more about what it does, if you need a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to use something in the lab that I didn't cover before, or maybe I didn't explain it well and you'd like me to do it again, I can absolutely do that. If you're building a collection or trying to find something to use with your students and are having trouble finding what you're looking for, I can help with that too. Um, I've been a part of the Smithsonian for a long time now, and I don't know everything we have, but I'm pretty good at finding stuff, so I'd be happy to help with that as well. As you think about questions, um, I just wanted to point to something that I, I hope will be helpful to a lot of you, especially those of you who are you know, starting to play around with the learning lab for the first time or are looking to expand your skills, but you want to do it on your own pace. If you haven't seen it already, I would highly recommend checking out our help center. I've mentioned this a few times earlier in the session as a place where you can find our set our schedule of upcoming and archived sessions. But on that page, you can also find our getting started guide which includes step-by-step -step instructions on how to do just about everything on the lab with screenshots. You can go at your own pace. To get that to the Help Center, uh, you can navigate there by clicking on the gear icon, which will appear in the lower right of every page on the lab. It says Help when you hover over it. The first uh, option up here says Visit Help Center. It'll bring you right there. We've got this uh, page just divided into the essentials, help for all users, and help for educators. Um, in the essentials is where you'll find that getting started guide. We've got it organized by the basics, discover, create, and share. And you can navigate through uh, each page of that guide on the panel on the left-hand side of the page. 
So just wanted to share that in case it was helpful for any of you watching. So again, I've really got no schedule for the final 20 minutes of this session. I'm just here to answer Learning Lab questions as they come in. So don't be afraid to put your question in the chat. No question is too small. I'm here to help. Um, while I wait for the next question to come in, I'm going to turn off my camera very briefly, but I will still be here, still watching the chat. And we'll come back as soon as the next question arrives. So see you soon. Hi folks, if you're just joining us, we're in the final 20 minutes of today's dual created collections and office hours session. During the first 30 minutes, I walked through how to create collections and add interactivity to them to use Digital Museum resources for learning. In these final 30 minutes, I'm here answering any questions that come in about the Learning Lab. I'm a digital content producer and educator here at the uh, Smithsonian Office of Educational Technology. And on this platform, I uh, create collections. I work on developing the platform, doing bug fixes and launching new tools. And I help educators like you uh, use it so you can bring uh, digital museum resources from the Smithsonian and beyond to your students. Um, so if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to help with them. I can help with things like a general introduction to the platform, what it is and how it works. I can walk you through step by step some of the lab's tools and features. Um, and I can help you find uh, something that you're looking for if you're having trouble. I've got a question that just came in from Allison. Allison, thank you. Let me pull it up. Allison's question is, can you delete content from your galleries? Yes, you can. And let me show you how to do that. So sometimes when you create a collection like I did earlier in this session, you decide later that, hey, this resource isn't working for me anymore. I want to remove it. Removing it is very easy. First thing I'm going to do is navigate over to that collection I built with you all earlier to demonstrate how to do so. Let me see if I can actually pop back in my history. Here we go. Okay. Here's that collection I was working on earlier. Again, to make changes to it, I'm going to click the green edit collection button. Now, when I'm in edit mode with the green bar at the top, when I hover over these resources, I'll see a few things pop up, including a red trash can. So say if I wanted to delete this resource from my collection, I could do so just by clicking the delete button. 
And there you go. I've deleted that resource from my collection. You can, of course, also delete your collection later as well, as long as we're talking about deleting. Doing so is pretty similar. While you're in edit mode, right over by that exit button in the upper right, you'll see three dots. If I click on this, it'll also give me the option with a red trash can to delete my collection. I'm not going to do that right now, but I just wanted to let you know that option's there for you. So, Allison, I hope that helps with your question. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so again, I'm just here answering questions as they come in. I have no real schedule uh, for the rest of our 15 minutes. I want to make sure all of you come away from today's session feeling confident and ready to use the Learning Lab to find digital museum resources and create interactive learning experiences with them. So if you have a question, no question is too small, please ask it in the chat. If you're joining us on YouTube or the comment box, if you're joining us on Facebook, I'd be happy to walk you through your question on here. Great, Allison, I'm so glad to hear that was helpful. While I wait for the next question to come in, I'd like to show you something cool that I use a lot um, in my own browsing of the Learning Lab. Um, I often like to see what people are creating in the Learning Lab to see what's new. Uh, so see what new collections are coming from educators working in classrooms and museums, what students are working on. You can browse all of the collections available on the Learning Lab via the home page. If you navigate to Discover, scroll down until you get to this section here, and there's a Browse All Collections button. Now, of course, I'm a super user, so I have this bookmarked, but even on a casual basis, I think it's really interesting to look at. That's how I saw the Lori Anderson collection that was published earlier today. So I can see all of the, uh, the Learning Labs and 9,600 plus Learning Lab collections created by educators, students, museum, staff, and more. Just like a search for resources, hovering over each of these uh, image thumbnails will give me a preview of the title and description. So I'm seeing some so cool stuff from the Cooper Hewitt, looking at a cochineal, I think that's how you pronounce it, which is an insect created uh, dye. Looks like a collection of maybe Valentine's Day cards getting ready for the holiday next week and so much more. Like searching for resources, you can also search or filter your search for collections by things like subject area, age range, uh, who created it. Was it created by a user or a regular user or a Smithsonian user? Uh, it can really help narrow down and help you find what you're looking for. So, of course, you know, age range too. We've got to organize by uh, big groups within the K-12 and post-secondary spectrum. So, again, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I just wanted to share that. It's something I use all the time. And in case you weren't aware of it, I want to make sure that you had a sense of it too. There's that Laurie Anderson collection. So again, I'm just here ready to answer any questions you have during these last 12 minutes. You can ask them either using the chat on YouTube or the comment box on Facebook. While I wait for questions to come in, I'm going to turn off my camera briefly, but I will still be here still watching the chat and I'll come back as soon as the next question arrives. So see you all soon.
All right, we are just wrapping up this hour um, during our creating collection session. During the first 30 minutes, I talked a little bit about how to create and customize collections of digital museum resources for learning. And during these last 30 minutes, we've had it open for a Q&A questions about any anything with the Smithsonian Learning Labs. So we talked a little bit about um, image file types and sizes for uploading resources to the Learning Lab. We've also talked a little bit about deleting resources from collections that you're working on. If you have a question that you've been holding on to, there's still time to ask it. You can enter questions using the chat box on YouTube or the comment box on Facebook. I'm happy to help uh, using screen sharing and my knowledge of the lab and the Smithsonian to try to answer your question. While I wait for any final questions to come in, I just wanted to circle back to our upcoming session, schedule of sessions, excuse me. Um, we host a sessions throughout every month uh, focusing on using digital museum resources for learning. So next, uh, month on March 10th, we're going to be hosting another getting started session, which is really focused for uh, newbies to the learning lab. Uh, it'll focus on what the learning lab is, and it'll share some examples of learning lab collections to help you get started thinking about how you might use the learning lab in your own learning experiences. And then on March 15th, we'll run another one of these creating collection sessions where we'll walk you through step by step how to create a collection and how to customize it using some of the lab's features. Uh, so please feel free to join those or share them with others if you have uh, colleagues that are interested in or are looking for a place to start. On Monday, February 28th, we're having a special cultivating learning session, which will focus on transferable techniques to use digital museum resources specifically in this session to support digital storytelling and uh, student engagement. We are very lucky to be joined by two wonderful educators from Montgomery College, Jamie Gillen and Matthew Decker, who will be sharing techniques for a range of age levels, not just college, but uh, K through 12 as well. And they'll also be joined by one of their students and together they'll talk about how they've implemented techniques in their classrooms and the impact that's had on students from a student's own point of view. So if that's interesting to you, I hope you'll be able to join us. All of these sessions, including this one you're watching right now, will be archived after they air. So if you can't attend any of these upcoming sessions live, don't worry. You'll be able to view the archive as soon as it finishes airing at the same link that uh, it airs live at. And you can see those links and the entire upcoming schedule at our help center which is located at the URL at the bottom of the screen, learninglab.si.edu slash help. Well, it seems like we have no more questions for today. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. If you have any questions, as always, please don't hesitate to contact us at learninglab at si.edu. I have access to this, as does the rest of the Learning Lab team, and we'd be happy to help you in any way we can. So I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you for those of you who joined us and asked questions and I'll see you again soon. Bye.